My name is Betsy Thielman. I'm the Provider Campaign Coordinator for Medical Assistance Programs at OHA. Um, this is part of an ongoing monthly series of provider collaboratives that address outreach, enrollment, and eligibility issues impacting providers and their patients who are covered by OHP. We are always pleased when community partners join us. It allows us to cross-pollinate ideas and solutions to challenges that are facing us. Um, we are going to get started, but I wanted to share a few housekeeping topics before we do. This morning, you should have received the slides for this presentation. Likewise, attached to this presentation, you'll see on the um, box to your right, um, the slides are attached for you to download. And you can only do that while the presentation is live. If you have questions, please type them into the box. We will address them at the end of the presentation. Whatever we do not get to, we will make sure to follow up with you on via written responses within a week or so. Before we introduce our presenter, I would like to let you know who else is in the room with us. We have um, a wealth of uh, people who are highly educated in all things pharmacy. So um, without further ado, I would like to invite Jamal to begin the introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm Jamal Khan, a policy analyst in the Medical Assistance Program Pharmacy team. I'm Shannon Jasper, also an analyst and drug coordinator. I am Linnea Ferris, and I am an analyst with the pharmacy program. Okay. And here is Rich. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Rich Holtzapel. Uh I am the Pharmacy Services Manager with Kula Packard uh, Enterprise Services. I always get a lot of people say, you're a pharmacist with HP? That doesn't make any sense. Well, HP is much more than a computer company. We actually uh, do uh, computer services, too. And our company runs the MMIS, which is the Medicaid Management Information System. And we also um, operate all of the, we do all the pharmacy operations for the state as well. Um, and so my role is, is to manage that team. Um, today, oh, just a brief background on myself. Um, I am a licensed pharmacist. I have worked uh, several years in retail. I've worked both uh, independent pharmacies as well as uh, chain drug stores. Um, I spent six years working at a uh, hospital pharmacy. I have also worked as a consultant at a pain clinic. So I worked in a clinic as a consultant pharmacist. And I've also worked both private and government insurance because I worked at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oregon. And now I've, the last six years, been working here at uh, HP for the state uh, Medicaid program. Um, today, I am, I am really grateful that you guys uh, joined today. I'm really hoping I can answer a lot of your questions around pharmacy, help you get a, a, a good insight as to how pharmacies operate, um, understand how they bill and how it's very, very different from how a, like a doctor's office bills. Um, and so kind of walk you through the processes of what pharmacies are doing back there when they're billing for insurance, um, whether it be Medicaid or others. And then we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the reasons why claims get denied at the pharmacy, uh, what pharmacies can do in those situations, and if your client gets uh, returned to you or comes to you, how you're able to help out your clients as well. Uh, I'm really hoping by the end of this that you will feel like you have a good understanding of how a pharmacy operates, um, that you'll also understand how pharmacies bill insurance, all kinds of insurance. Um, as well as have those references in the back of your mind so you understand um, ways that you can actually um, productively help clients uh, work with pharmacies, um, work with other providers uh, to help Medicaid clients. Okay, I started throwing out some common pharmacy acronyms. Um, I'm not going to go into detail as to what each of these are, but you're going to hear me say PBM and POS. BIN, PCN. I'm going to be saying those in my presentation. So this is just a, a slide for you to reference. Um, I, just briefly, a pharmacy benefit manager basically is 
It's a company that processes the pharmacy claims and everything that goes along with processing the pharmacy claims. Um, we will be doing a lot of talking around point of sale and what that is. Um, I threw NCPDP up there just, just for you to know who it is, it's the national group that makes all the standards for uh, that type of claim billing. Uh, the BIN, PCN, those are basically just the identification numbers uh, for PBMs um, so that pharmacies, they use that to uh, basically direct their claims so that um, so they get so the claims get to the right insurance company. Okay. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is walk you through basically what happens at a pharmacy, and this is not specific for Medicaid. This is for anybody, all of you. Uh, I'm sure at one time or another you have walked to a pharmacy with a prescription for yourself or your family, and have wondered what goes on behind the counter and why it's sometimes it's ready fast and sometimes you have to wait two and a half hours or the next day uh, for that prescription to be done. Um, so here's, here's basic operations and I'll just walk through this step by step. So you show up at the counter with your prescription. Uh, normally it's a pharmacy technician that will take your prescription. Um, if you're new to the pharmacy, they will enter your personal information, phone number, address, that kind of stuff. Um, they will ask if you have insurance, uh, which time you will present them your insurance card because everyone's really good and carries their insurance card with them at all times um, and can give that to the pharmacy, which really helps them uh, to get that um, information in their system. Um, after they've collected that, um, they kind of do a once over. You'll kind of notice them read over the prescription if it's a hard copy and uh, make sure they don't have any basic questions and then they'll tell you how long it's going to be and send you away. Uh, sometimes just go shopping, um, so you could buy more stuff at your store. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, sometimes that's why. Um, now, so then they will enter the information um, into the system for for your insurance. Um, they use on your card. If you anybody looks at your card, we'll have a couple of examples of Medicaid cards later on. Um, you will see the pharmacy information that's on your insurance card. It says uh, BIN and PCN and group. Um, and that those numbers, those IDs, are what the pharmacy uses to know who to bill for the prescription. So the first thing they do, uh, the tech will enter all that information. They submit the pharmacy claim right away. That's a, like one of the first things that happens is submitting that claim to the insurance. Um, if the patient doesn't have insurance, they just set it to cash and then they proceed uh, with the process. Um, if the insurance claim comes back paid, um, again, like cash, they just move on to the next step. If the insurance denies it at this point, um, the explanation of benefits that comes back on that denial will tell the pharmacy why the claim was denied um, and there could be a thousand different reasons for the denial. So at that point, the pharmacy techs will try and troubleshoot the billing issues if they can. Um, so there, there are something, and again, we're going to be talking about specifics uh, later on in the presentation about uh, different denials and what they can do and what they can't do. Um, so if they're able to troubleshoot the billing issue and get a paid claim, uh, that's great. If not, then uh, if there's no way for them to get a paid claim from the insurance, then they have to change it to cash so that they can proceed to the next steps. Um, usually at that point it gets sent over to the pharmacist's computer. Um, they look at the hard copy, they compare it to the information that the tech has entered into the system, uh, make sure that the tech picked the right drug in the system. Um, so, they're, so they're kind of doing a computer check of, of the prescription, make sure everything's accurate. And once the, the pharmacist has checked it and it's all uh, good, and of course to get to that point you've either had a paid response from the insurance or it's been set to cash, that point, then a label can be printed. And um, so that's to say, a lot of pharmacy software, you can't print a label with a denied insurance claim. It either has to be paid or it has to be switched to cash. That's the only way you can get a label printed and, and finish filling the prescription. Um, so once the label's printed, pharmacy techs uh, usually, sometimes the pharmacist himself um, or herself, goes and gets the medication, fills it, puts the label on it, uh, the text will leave the hard copy of the prescription along with the stock bottle 
um, and the prescription, and the pharmacist will come by and double check it again. Uh, in most pharmacies, they, all controlled drugs have to be recounted by the pharmacist. Um, and then they usually initial it, and then it gets bag tagged and put in the pickup area ready for the client to pick it up. So some of the key things that have to happen is that the pharmacy really needs to have the insurance card. Um, not having that just saying, well, I have such and such insurance, it doesn't help. Um, there, there's just uh, too much variation in there. It's not that easy. Um, also, ID numbers are not simple anymore, whether it's private or Medicaid or any other insurance. The ID numbers are not something people have memorized, kind of like bank account numbers. People don't normally have their bank account memorized. Some do, but I, I do, but others don't. <laughs> um, this is a big one, and this is the best I need to get across, is that in standard practice, all drugs have to be paid for prior to leaving the pharmacy whether that is the insurance paying for it or the patient paying for it, that drug cannot leave the pharmacy without being paid by somebody. Um, that is standard common practice and a lot of pharmacies, um, they, will not let, they will not let that medication out the door unless it's either been paid by the insurance or paid by the client or the patient. Now, there are exceptions only for Medicaid, this is the only time, and um, it's only in sp particular situations, but it is still up to the pharmacy. Um, nobody can force a pharmacy to make exceptions. If an exception is going to be made to this, it is up to the pharmacy, and we will talk more about that later. Um, so I won't go on it now. So anyway, if everything goes smoothly, if there's no problems with the insurance, there's no problems with prescription, and everything is, you know, the drugs in stock and everything, it, it really only takes three to four minutes to, from start to finish to fill a prescription. So you're like, why does it take me an hour or two hours do I have to sit there and wait for my prescription? Well, because inevitably <laughs> there are issues. And there, basically there's two big time-consuming issues. There's an problem with the prescription itself or there's a problem with the insurance. Um, so I just some examples up here, if, if you have problems with the prescription, usually it's, uh, you know, you're asking for a refill but you don't have a refill so you have to get an authorization. Um, the drug requires a prior auth. Um, it's out of stock. Sometimes, uh, a lot of times there's prescribing provider needs to be contacted either to verify because, you know, it used to be you couldn't read the writing sometimes, even though we're really, really good at that as pharmacists, reading writing. Um, now with electronic prescriptions, uh, it's made that part easier, but we also find that doctors don't always select the right product in their computer system, or when they're typing in their instructions, it comes out really funny looking, you know, insert one tablet into your ear daily, uh, things like that. And, um, or you have a drug interaction, or it, it could be a multiple of uh, reasons reasons, uh, multitude of reasons for the pharmacy to have to call the doctor's office. Um, and for those of you who work in the doctor's office, you know that not always is the pharmacy going to get an answer immediately when they call um, because you're going to get the receptionist and they're going to have to wait for either the nurse or the doctor to, to be able to have time between patients or uh, later to answer that question and get back to the pharmacy. So, so uh, the other one's the insurance. Uh, dealing with insurances, dealing with denied claims, um, being on the phone with the insurance company um, to find out if there's not enough information on that denied claim, then they have to call and find out what's going on um, to see if there's anything they can do, you know, or, or getting a prior authorization um, also takes time, so. And Rich, I just w I, w I would like to add also that um, it takes time to fill a prescription because your prescription is one of hundreds that are in a queue to yeah. be filled or refilled. So if you can only imagine, you're not the only prescription there right. for them to fill. So yep. these issues just are compiled. Yes, we. the average chain drugstore fills between four and 600 scripts a day. Um, so they're really pumping them out. And anytime you have to stop the process to, to, to do something extra, it, it really impedes on the time and how fast and 
Um, it may be your script that's causing the backup of everybody else, but it may be the person in front of you's script that's causing the backup and everything else. You know, and it's not like everything's done in a perfect order. Um, the pharmacies will get the easy, fast ones and go around the ones that are causing problems. You know, they they work as efficiently as they can, and believe me, there, there needs to be a lot of efficiency to get that many scripts out per day. Um, it, it's a huge volume. Um, the other thing is that there really there is no billing department in a pharmacy. So you know, the, like I said, it's the first thing done. The tech does it. It would be akin to a, a clinic. You go in, and the nurse that does your intake takes your blood pressure, and that is also billing your claim for you. Um, and so, you know, there's no billing office. There's no people working on just billing. Um, it's the actual pharmacy techs, and on occasion, the pharmacists themselves um, trying to troubleshoot uh, both uh, prescription and insurance issues. Okay, so we're going to move on now to uh, the pharmacy claim billing process. So pharmacies bill, pretty much all pharmacy claims go through point of sale. Um, and these point of sale claims are billed to the PBMs, the pharmacy benefit managers. Um, the point of sale is very different from medical billing because it is real time. So the real time claim is billed through an EDI, electronic data, uh, interface transmission directly to the PBM system. And in the case of fee-for-service, that is the MMIS. The MMIS is the PBM system. And that claim gets processed, and they get a real-time response back uh, with either a paid claim or a denial with the reason for the denial. So how do they know which PBM to bill? Well, uh, for Medicaid, like I said, you know, uh, on the, the, let me start with the Medicaid ID. The basic Medicaid ID, the top one there, really the only information on there is the client ID. But client ID is an absolute necessary piece of information that the pharmacies have to have in order to bill a claim. They don't have the ID number. They can't. They don't know who to how to bill it. Um, whoop, that's right. Um, there's no BIN, PCN information on there for fee service, but every pharmacy in the state of Oregon knows the BIN and PCN for Oregon Medicaid. It's built into their system. It's like one of the first insurances that any new pharmacy would enroll with is Medicaid. Um, the below card is an example of a CCO enrolled client. Um, they would get a separate uh, Medicaid card that would also have their uh, Medicaid ID. Their Medicaid ID is still their Medicaid ID, whether they're enrolled with, whether they're fee for service or, or enrolled with the CCO. Um, but this information, because the CCO uses a separate PBM, that information is down there below. You see the RX bin, RX PCN, RX group. And so that's the information the pharmacists need and to know what to enter in their system to know where to submit the claim. All right, so here's kind of a detailed process of what happens when a point of sale claim is submitted. So the claim is sent for the pharmacy through a switch, which we won't spend a lot of time on. Um, to the identified PBM system using that BIN or PCN. That PBM system, or the claims processing system, which is the MMIS for fee-for-service, it takes that claim and it goes through what's called a claims engine. And what that claims engine does is it verifies the eligibility, it checks the client's TPL, Medicare is rolled CCO, it looks at the drug coverage, the benefit plan rules, um, it looks to see if that drug has any kind of restrictions on it, if it requires prior or off, if there's quantity limit. Um, it goes through a whole bunch of different edits, um, checking validation on that prescription. Then it calculates a price uh, based on the, uh, the uh, contracted rate that, that PBM has with the pharmacy. Um, and then that response gets submitted back. Is either a paid claim or denied with the explanation to the denial. Now that whole process takes five, on average, five seconds. That all happens, and that's why I say it's real time. They are getting a real time submission and response from the insurance. Um, that is why that's why they do it first. <laughs> the first thing in the process is done. So if you got insurance paying for it, you can go on. If insurance is not paying for it, you change the cash and then fill the prescription. Pharmacy bill at least 100 different PBMs. 
Um, if you look at all the different private insurances, the Medicare D plans, uh, Medicaid plans, CCO plans, different PBMs, uh, there, there are hundreds of PBMs in our country. Um, here's a few examples of the larger ones, Catamaran, MedImpact, CBS Caremark, Argus, Express Scripts. These are all PBMs. Um, so insurance companies will subcontract uh, these PBMs to be their claims processor for pharmacy claims. Um, and so the then PCN tells the pharmacy which, which of those PBMs to do. Now every pharmacy has to be contracted with each of those individual PBMs. And there's, because there's so many, it's hard to keep, you know, keep information on every single PBM out there. That's why insurance cards are so important. Um, so I've said this a couple times and I'll keep saying it, the MMIS system is the PBM for Medicaid fee-for-service. So those claims are going directly to the MMIS system. So the pharmacy is using that response um, to determine eligibility and coverage because it's basically the MMIS telling them the patient's eligibility and coverage. That claim response is their checking eligibility. So here's a little, just a little pictorial. Uh, pharmacy claim gets sent to the pharmacy directly to the MMIS for fee for service, and it's going through that claims process that we had already talked about, and all that's happening in a matter of seconds. And a response is going back to the pharmacy, telling them whether the claim is paid or whether it's denied and why it's denied. So, if the response from the MMIS point of sale says the patient's not eligible, that means the patient's not eligible in the MMIS. If it comes back and says the patient is eligible, if they're enrolled in the CCO, so it denies and tells pharmacy the patient is enrolled in the CCO, bill the CCO. Um, if a client happens to have primary insurance, it'll come back and tell the pharmacy the patient has primary insurance, bill primary insurance. Same with Medicare. Uh, it'll say patients enrolled in Medicare, this drug should be billed to Medicare first. So that'll those those are some of the basic you know, denial uh, explanations to get sent back. So because that information is coming directly from the MMIS, it really doesn't matter if a pharmacy could access or would access the MMIS through a web portal or the AVR because it's the same information, same place. So there's, there's no need for them to, to try to access the MMIS any other way. They're using their claims to do that. Um, there are some limitations. Um, pharmacies do not go out and verify client eligibility prior to submitting a claim. Uh, that's a big difference between uh, how doctor's offices bill medical claims and how pharmacy claims are billed. Um, it's not done ahead of time. They just, there's no, like I said, there's no billing department. There's no staff. There's nobody's going to sit there and call and make sure that you have eligibility before a claim gets submitted. That, that claims submission is their eligibility check, is what it is. Um, they do, because they are an enrolled provider, they do have access to the web portal and the AVR, but they don't keep track of passwords and PINs. You can imagine every PBM out there, hundreds of them, probably have AVRs and PIN numbers, and sometimes those go to corporate offices and not the individual stores. It's just not worth it to them because it's not going to help them in the long run. And like I said, no billing office, no staff to um, pursue client ID information. Now there are there are a lot of pharmacies that if a client shows up and says, I have Medicaid, but I don't have my card, I don't know my ID, they will make the call to the pharmacy call center to say, can you look up this patient and tell me what their ID number is. So um, they, they do have the ability to do that. And a lot of pharmacies that I know of will do that. That's, you know, um, it's kind of a basic thing um, to do that for for Medicaid clients. Um, but there are pharmacies that won't. If the client doesn't have their card, they won't bill the, the insurance because they don't have the ID. Okay, so if client is open card fee for service and doesn't know the name, so th this is kind of the process. So if a client shows up at the pharmacy, they have a Medicaid card, that basic first one I showed you, it's just the basic Medicaid card with just an ID number, and they don't really know if they're enrolled in the CCO or not. Uh, what pharmacies will typically do is always bill fee-for-service first. So they'll submit a claim, 
to the Open Card Fee for Service, which is the MMIS. And if it pays, that obviously means they're fee for service. Um, if they're enrolled in the CCO, it'll send back a response saying this client's enrolled in the CCO. So if they get the response that the client's enrolled in the CCO, um, it, it depends on the situation. If, if they're in a county that there's only one CCO operating in that county, the pharmacies will be familiar with that CCO and their PBM and will just turn around and bill it to that PBM uh, knowing that that's, that's the CCO in their area. If they're in a county that has multiple CCOs operating, um, what they'll have to do is call the pharmacy call center to find out which uh, CCO the client's enrolled in um, so they know uh, who to bill for the claim. Um, the one thing the MMIS doesn't do, it doesn't display the name of the CCO that the client's enrolled in. It just says the client is enrolled in a CCO. So that, that claim response, that explanation of benefits doesn't tell the pharmacy which CCO they're on. So they would have to make a, a phone call in a lot of cases uh, to find out which CCO they're enrolled in and who to bill. Um, CCOs, PBM, okay, so if the CCO, you find out which CCO they're enrolled in and you bill their PBM. Now if they deny it, at, at this point, neither is paying for it. They're both denying it. Um, pharmacies really have no choice but to change the cash at this point. Um, because the systems are showing, the MMIS system shows they're eligible, but they're enrolled in the CCO, and that CCO, PBM is saying they're not eligible. And the pharmacies at that point can't do anything more. Um, they can't say, well, the MMIS says they're enrolled, so we'll just give them their meds and bill it later. They're not going to do that, because that goes back to that very first thing I said. Drugs can't go out the door without having a paid claim or the client paying cash. And we'll talk about how to troubleshoot those issues uh, later on. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the CCOs, um, specifically how that eligibility information gets uh, from the MMIS to, to the CCOs. Um, all the CCOs have uh, subcontracted out a PBM, a pharmacy benefit manager that processes all their pharmacy claims for them. Um, there's a link there to uh, the PBM information for all the CCOs. I was informed today that updates are being made to it today. And so, because there was some changes to some phone numbers and some information, um, but that link should be updated by tomorrow? By tomorrow morning? Okay. So by tomorrow morning, it should be accurate and up-to-date information. Um, we we asked the, the pharmacy directors and all the CCOs to keep us updated if there's any changes. Uh, to their PBM information, and so that's out there for you. Um, most, uh, pretty much all the pharmacies in Oregon know PBM information for the CCOs, especially if they bill them a lot. Um, they, they'll, they'll know that. A lot of this PBM information is actually stored in the computer software. Um, they they could type in, you know, uh, sometimes they have a three-letter code that's like, uh, Health share, and it'll pop up the bin and PCN because it saves it from from that client or from other clients who've been with Health Share. So it's not like they have to manually enter it every single time. Um, There's some common ones that they do. Uh, they they have saved in their system that'll probably still populate some of that information for them. Um, but they still need the card to verify that it's the right one. Um, this is another big is, uh, not issue, but a thing about Oregon. Or Oregon is kind of different from a lot of states in that the managed care organizations are able to have their own prior auth criteria and their own preferred drug list that is different than the fee-for-service Medicaid one. Um, there are a lot of states out there that have a, what's called a statewide PDL and statewide PA criteria, and the managed cares in their states have to follow the open card or fee-for-service one. That's not the case in Oregon. In Oregon, you know, we have 16 CCOs, and every one of them can have a different preferred drug list and a different PA criteria. On top of that, if you add in private insurances and Medicare D insurances and all that, all of them have different formularies, preferred drug lists. Um, doctor's offices can't keep track of 100 different lists, um, and I don't expect the pharmacies to either. So. Um, it, 
there's no way to say, oh, that person's this insurance, so this is their preferred drug list. You can. There's access to that information, um, but you'd have to have somebody spending a lot of time going in and looking at each and every one. Okay, so here's a little uh, pictorial of the eligibility flow from the MMIS to the CCOs PBM. So every day, the MMIS system sends enrollment info files to the CCOs. They're called 834 files. Um, every day, any updates, changes, you know, deletions, those get submitted to the CCO. So the CCO receives that file every day. Now then the CCO turns around and sends that same eligibility information to their PBMs, usually within either the same day or within a day, sometimes two, but rarely does it take two days. So that's how the inf eligibility information gets to their PBM to get entered. One more. So in most cases, the CCO enrollment information gets from the MMIS to the PBN within a day, at two at the most. But we have had issues um, for different reasons where that eligibility isn't getting all the way to the CCO's PBM in a timely fashion. In that case, you know, that's when you have the situation where they're showing enrolled in the MMIS, but it shows they're enrolled with the CCO, so the claims are denying fee for service, but the PBM for their enrolled CCO is saying they're not eligible. Um, and again, we'll talk about what to do a little bit later on. Okay. Um, as far as the billing goes, I've shown you a pictorial with fee for service where the pharmacy claims going directly to the MMIS for fee for service because the MMIS is the PBM. Uh, it's, it's all the same system for fee for service. Um, in the case of CCOs, they're sending their eligibility information and their benefit plan coverage rules to their PBM, and the pharmacy is billing the claim using the BNPCN to the PBM. And they're getting, it's a real-time point-of-sale claim and a real-time response um, for, those, for those claims with the PBM. Okay, um, I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time on the Medicare and Medicaid dual eligibles, so we're going to flip through these slides pretty quick. Um, I, the only thing I really wanted to say is that Medicare does have to be billed before Medicaid, and there are some things that are Medicare B covered, and there are some things that are Medicare D covered. And I'm not going to go into a whole lot more detail than that, um, so you can go ahead and go through. Um, we'll talk a little bit about primary insurance. So third-party third liability is primary insurance or private insurance that a client may have. I think the takeaway that I need to get to you is that Medicaid is always, 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 always the payer of last resort. That means that any private insurance has to be billed first. Any Medicare has to be billed first before Medicaid will pay on the claim. So if they have primary insurance, they, that is always primary over Medicaid. Um, so the pharmacies will bill the primary insurance as PBM, um, and then they can submit to Medicaid secondary. So pharmacy software allows them, a lot of them are limited to only billing up to two insurances, um, so they'll bill the primary insurance and then they'll bill Medicaid secondary, uh, and that's fine. Um, that's called coordination of benefits. COB or coordination of benefits is where you bill the primary insurance and then you turn around and bill the, the balance or secondarily to another insurance. That's coordination of benefits. So Medicaid does offer coordination of benefits um, with private insurances and with Medicare. Um, a lot of private insurances do not do coordination of benefits. So we, and this is kind of a side note for you personally. So if you have two private insurances, let's say you have Blue Cross Blue Shield of Oregon and you have uh, Providence, you know, through your spouse or something. The pharmacies, most pharmacy software won't bill both insurances um, because they're both private insurances. And, and that's just uh, a, a limitation to pharmacy software or policies within uh, corporate pharmacies. But Medicaid, by contract, they have to bill Medicaid secondary. They have to offer secondary billing for Medicaid clients. 
All right. So here's where I want to spend some time um, talking about some of the reasons why uh, claims are denied and what can be done about it. So we'll start with the first issue. First issue is the client is not eligible for Medicaid. They just aren't enrolled. Um, so both a fee-for-service or a CCO claim is going to be denied because the client is not showing it's covered by Medicaid in the MMIS. So what do you do? In most cases, the standard policy is that the patient then pays for their medication. They pay cash. If that eligibility gets updated at a later time, the pharmacies can go back, rebuild that claim, and once they get a paid claim from the insurance, then they can reimburse the patient what they paid. This is what happens most of the time. Um, pharmacy software allows them to go back and build claims. That the MMIS will allow them up to a year to build that claim at the pharmacy, up to a, a year after it was dispensed. Um, most pharmacies have a little shorter uh, time limit that their software allows. Yeah, I, the shortest we've ever seen is two weeks, which is really, really short. Most pharmacies will go back a month or two months. Um, but they have that ability to do that. And most pharmacies, I, I, any pharmacy that I've worked with is willing to do that and, and reimburse the client um, if they paid cash for their drug. So, uh, you know, as long as the pharmacy is getting paid, you know, somebody's paying for it. <laughs> that's, that's the most important thing. So reimbursing the client happens all the time. And that happens not just Medicaid, but private insurance and all other kinds of insurance. So now there are the exceptions that I said are the big exceptions and only for pharmacies that agree to do this, in which case a medication could actually go out the door without actually being paid at that time. And the two most recent scenarios uh, that you may be familiar with already are those who have hospital presumptive eligibility or those who have enrolled with Medicaid through the, through the healthcare.gov federal exchange. In both cases, the clients will have letters. Um, and you can go to the next slide. Um, in both cases, the clients will have a letter, either from that enrollment that was done while they were at the hospital, or they will get a letter uh, after they've enrolled through healthcare.gov. Um, now, there are two letters from healthcare.gov. One that says you do qualify for Medicaid, and there's another letter that says that you may qualify for Medicaid. The only ones that pharmacies will do this exception for are the ones that say you do qualify for Medicaid. If they get one, a letter back from the federal exchange that says you may qualify, that is not a guarantee. So they're not going to accept that and do the special process for those people because obviously there's some other criteria that they're going to have to meet to see if they really do qualify for Medicaid or not. Now, OHA staff, Linnea sitting across from me here has done a great job job in working, because this is really a huge exception to the process, um, we've had to work with chains and uh, the pharmacies. Um, Linnea has worked really well with the corporates uh, to say, would you partner with the state in uh, going through the process that when somebody shows up with one of these letters, that the pharmacy could call the call center. Um, and what my call center will do um, is that we will fill out a form for the pharmacy that is basically a guarantee of payment form saying that you can go ahead and dispense the medications to the client because based on the letters they have, we can guarantee that we will pay these medications for you once they're enrolled in the system. Um, one of the things we'll do is we'll look at the medications that are being asked for they're obviously a, a, an excluded drug, we're not going to offer a guarantee of payment for those. Um, but any other normally covered drug, we, we would offer a guarantee of payment for. So the pharmacy, if they are in agreement and will be willing to do this, uh, they can release the medication to the patient uh, without getting paid for it, uh, but holding on to that form paper. And we keep track of those. And once the client is in the MMIS system, um, we will call that pharmacy back and say, okay, now you can bill for those claims. And then the pharmacy can go in and get paid claims. And, and we'll help override, um, in those special circumstances, we'll help override any, any edits or anything that might come up uh, to make sure that they are actually getting paid uh, for those claims as, as, as they re did receive a guarantee. Um, so far, this has gone really well. The pharmacies that have agreed to do this and are partnering with it, um, 
we've been able to get all of them their paid claims so far. Um, the only downside to it is that and this is getting better, but there was quite a bit of lag time between the patient enrolling in healthcare.gov and that eligibility getting from the federal government to the state and then getting into the system. So pharmacies are having to hold on to these receipts for a month or two in some cases before they were able to go back and bill for them. Um, but luckily we have, that hasn't, as far as I know, dissuaded any of them yet. Um, we have to make sure that they actually are getting their reimbursement because if they don't, they're going to stop doing this for us. Um, so we, we continue to work really hard with them. And, you know, we will, if we get notified with these, we have people here at the state that we contact and say, hey, here's a client that just got a hospital presumptive eligibility. Can you please get them in the system as soon as possible so we can get the pharmacy to build their scripts through? Um, so anyway, I, just keep in mind, this is what we're doing. It is a it is an exception. There's nothing, there's no way you can mandate a pharmacy to do this. The pharmacies have to be willing to do it. All right, another issue. So the CCO doesn't have its PBM information or client enrollment information to their PBM system. So that's that lag we're talking about. Uh, or for some reason, their client is eligible and enrolled in the CCO, but the PBM for that CCO doesn't have that in their system. So the claim is denying is the patient's not eligible. So what do we do? Next slide. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what do we do? Um, so in a lot of cases, it's, it's the standard process of the patient pays cash for it. And then once the eligibility does get updated, the pharmacy can go back and bill that claim and then reimburse the client. Um, most of you know that clients for Medicaid clients cannot get reimbursed from the state directly. Um, unlike private insurances uh, where you could submit your claims and the insurance company will reimburse you for that, Medicaid clients cannot do that. They cannot get, they cannot send in receipts to the state and get reimbursed. Um, so if they're going to get reimbursed, it's going to be the pharmacy reimbursing them, which pharmacies will do. They do it all the time. Uh, once they bill it through and get the insurance to pay, they'll reimburse the client. Um, if it's a high-priced drug, something that the patient just can't afford, um, there are some other options, um, but in most of those cases, the pharmacy would need to call the pharmacy call center, my call center, which will be given that information at the end of the presentation um, to see what other options are out there. Um, you know, sometimes clients choose to just pay for three days worth, you know, and that gives enough time for the eligibility to get updated and then they can get their full fill. Um, there, there are also some other possibilities, depending on the situation, um, that the pharmacy can work with the call center uh, to help those clients. So next situation, uh, medications just not covered. So there are plenty of medications that we just, that, that just, uh, they're, they're not a covered drug by Medicaid. So in that case, the client either has to pay cash for it or go back to the doctor to either do some other, other alternative or uh, some other option for treatment. Um, early refill, we get a lot of early refills. Um, the system rules state that 80% of the previous fill must be used uh, before the next fill is allowed. So if you get a 30-day supply of your meds, it has to have been at least 24 days before the next fill is allowed to be filled. Um, otherwise, it will deny for early refill. So what do you do when that comes up? Well, ob the obvious thing is just to wait a couple of days until your next fill is due. Um, however, there are situations where there's a good cause for the early refill, and the pharmacies have the ability to put in the override for those special circumstances. Uh, the most common by far is that the dosage has changed, and the patient's thinking it's supposed to be taking a higher dose now. Um, if that's verified, then they can say that there's been a change in dosage, and that's why it's being filled early. Um, we do allow clients to get a vacation supply or a loss um, if they lose it, getting it filled again. Um, but we do keep track of those. And if, you know, we find a client is doing this regularly, we will, <laughs> we will know. Put it that way. <laughs> um, client lock-in. So the state does have a lock-in uh, program in which they are locked into a single pharmacy. That means all their scripts have to come from one pharmacy. 
So how do clients get locked in? Well, there's, there's a couple scenarios. One, if they are using three or more pharmacies and multiple prescribers for controlled drugs in a six-month period, they're going to get locked in. Um, so, you know, we're trying to prevent the clients who are going out to see multiple doctors, go to multiple pharmacies, um, and, and, and one not knowing what the other is doing. So that way we lock them into one pharmacy so at least the pharmacist at one place knows everything they're getting and, and can kind of keep some control on that. Again, uh, any clients who are approved for Suboxone or Subutex, which are uh, drugs that are used in opioid uh, dependence and withdrawal, um, they will be locked into a single pharmacy. Um, so these are the drugs are only used in the cases of uh, these drugs require prior auth, and they're only approved for patients who are going through opioid withdrawal. Um, it's just safer and healthier for the client to have to be restricted to one um, pharmacy, um, so that you know all of their medications can be monitored that way. Um, there are obviously there are specific circumstances in which a client that is locked in needs to go to a different pharmacy. Um, most commonly because the pharmacy that they're locked into doesn't have the drug in stock. Uh, that's usually the most common. Um, again, the pharmacy can call us in those certain circumstances and we can override that lock-in uh, for that one particular claim. Um, but um, yeah, so they just, the pharmacy needs to call the call center. And I also said, so we we'll back up, sorry, but the client, clients also could call the customer service unit too. Uh, sometimes these uh, special requests are asked by the client um, through the CSU. So, all right, um, another issue. Medication requires prior auth, um, and there's no PA in the system. So let me talk about pharmacy prior auths really quick. Um, so fee-for-service Medicaid prior authorizations are always submitted by the doctor or the prescriber's office. The pharmacies cannot submit prior auth. Um, so what happens when the claim denies saying the drug requires prior authorization? Uh, the pharmacies will notify the provider's office uh, by phone or by fax, most often by fax, um, that the medication they prescribed uh, requires prior authorization. Um, at that point, the provider could submit the PA request to us um, through phone, fax, provider web portal. There's multiple ways they could submit prior auth. By law, we process all received pharmacy prior authorizations within 24 hours of receipt. And that is monitored very closely. We get fined if they take longer than 24 hours. So um, every pharmacy prior auth is getting processed within the 24 hours. Um, responses are sent by uh, mail um, to the provider's offices with the approval or denial. Um, however, providers can always go in and through their web portal or through their AVR and check on the PA status for the PAs they've submitted. Okay, and another issue, pharmacy doesn't have the current information about the prime, about the, uh, the client's primary insurance um, or what's in the MMIS is wrong regarding the primary insurance. So what happens in the situation is that the, the TPL is billed first um, it, TBL has to be billed first. We've already covered that. Um, if they try to bill it to Medicaid, we're going to deny it saying you have to bill the primary insurance um, first. Okay. Um, there are situations uh, with TPL that the pharmacy did their codes for. Uh, for instance, if the primary insurance uh, was billed but the claim got denied, um, there are certain situations where we will ju then just pay primary. Um, and there are certain situations where we won't. Um, one of the key ones is if the primary insurance denies it, saying that the drug requires prior auth with their insurance, they have to follow through with that prior auth process in the primary insurance. Even if the drug doesn't require prior auth Medicaid, um, we won't pay for it until the primary insurance has at least processed a prior auth request. That has to be done first. Um, situation where the primary insurance, is, it actually pays the claim, but they don't pay anything because the primary insurance has a high deductible or a high co high copay. Um, in that case, pharmacy submits it to a secondary, showing that the primary paid zero and we pay secondary. 
um, as if we were primary, I guess. And then another situation is that the pharmacy is verified that there is no TPL, even though the MMIS says there is. So let me talk about that a little bit more. Um, so if the client doesn't have TPL coverage, but the MMIS still shows the TPL coverage, um, that claim is going to get denied both by Medicaid and by the TPL. So if, if, the, if the pharmacy bills the primary insurance and says patient's no longer eligible, that is a denial in which case Medicaid will then pay the claim primary and they would submit to it. If they don't, let's see, this is one thing with the Medicaid recipients. If they show up and say, I have Medicaid, and they bill Medicaid, and we deny it saying the primary has primary insurance, and the client says, no, I don't. I don't have primary insurance. The pharmacy is not going to just take their word for it. <laughs> um, because we've had, you know, they don't want to be liable, and they can, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So, okay, let me let put that on hold for a second. So, what do you do when this situation comes up? So, first of all, there is a link there where um, people can go to to report um, private insurance um, updates. So, if something needs to be changed in the MMIS, is that right? Is that where the MMIS needs to be changed? Because, sorry, okay. So, so the MMIS has incorrect information about the primary insurance. So there is there is a link there uh, that can be going you can go to to make those changes if it is your client. Um, so some somebody has to make an update to the MMIS if the TPL insurance is wrong. Go to the next one. Oh, I guess I, I cut out that. I'm going to go back to what I was saying before. So if the patient if the patient's the one saying that they don't have primary insurance, but the MMIS says they do. The pharmacy is going to tell the client to go back and talk to their caseworker or to their person. And that client's going to come to you because the pharmacy really, they're not going to just take their word for it and override that because um, we would audit them for any time that they are overriding and having Medicaid pay primary. Um, and so unless they can verify it by having tried to build primary and got a denied claim or some other way, they're not going to take that risk based on the word of the client. So that's why it's really important that if you're able to make sure that the primary insurance in the MMIS is updated and, and accurate, um, it helps with claim billing. Whew. i got to hurry up here. Okay, last issue. Um, Medicare enrollment, it's really the same as, as TPL. Um, we do get Medicare assignments uh, that are uploaded twice per month um, from the feds. And again, if, if they're showing that they have Medicare, that really needs to be billed first before Medicaid. I hope you're not asleep. Um, I know it's been a long and there's a ton of information in here. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you, you've either got questions or you're, uh, these slides are hopefully you can go back and reference. So, so just some references for you in the future um, for you to help. The pharmacy or provider uh, call center, this is my team. Um, it is open with live people 24-7, 365. They will always get an answer. Um, the actual pharmacists and pharmacy technicians are available 9 to 9, Monday to Friday, and 10 to 5, 30, Saturday. That mostly equates to most pharmacies operating hours in the state of Oregon. Um, and they are also the unit that does all the prior authorizations for pharmacy as well. Um, they only talk to providers, um, but uh, whether it's a pharmacy provider or a doctor's office. Um, if, you have a pharm if you're a doctor's office and you have a pharmacy-related question, please don't call PSU, because PSU is not trained on pharmacy. Um, use this number and call the pharmacy call center, and they can help answer your questions or troubleshoot any issues. Clients have the client services number. So this is the number you would give a client to call the OHA client services unit. And uh, just wanted to throw in there that in certain circumstances, circum, I almost said circumcision, circumstances, <laughs> in certain circumstances, if the pharmacy needs to issue an emergency supply, they can call the pharmacy call center and get a four-day emergency supply covered. Um, so this would be one for like the drug, the, the patient gets from the ER and the drug requires a prior auth. No ER physician is going to submit a prior authorization. It's Saturday, pharmacy can call. We can do a four-day override so they can get through the weekend and then contact their doctor on Monday. 
if you're an OHA staff person or caseworker or community partner, um, and you have a question, you can submit an email to the DMAP Rx questions or contact one of us on the last slide directly, which is after this. There's, here's some more references for you. Uh, that first reference really has a link to the, the, the preferred drug list, the PA guide that shows all the PA criteria, uh, all kinds of pharmacy rules and information. I also put a link there for the Medicare covered drugs so you can see what's covered by Medicare B, what's covered by Medicare D. If those questions come up. And thank you for tuning in today. I think I only went one minute over, <laughs> but we don't have any time for Q&A, I don't think. Okay. Um, I just sent a message out to the audience. If you did submit a question, and there aren't a whole lot, uh, this is Jennifer Smith, and I will be in touch via email to answer those questions. Also, if you have additional questions, let one of us know, and we will be in touch with you with, them, with that. Is there a way for everybody to see what the questions are and the answers to talk to everybody, or is it just for the person? Yeah, it's on the list. Oh, perfect. That's good. So we'll do it. We'll write up the Q and A and send it out. We will. So yeah. and please, like I said, here are our contacts. If you have a question you would like to submit that comes to you later after we're done here, um, you know, please please reach out to us or or send an email to DMFRX questions and. It usually comes to one of us anyway. So, thank you so much, Rich. You're welcome. This concludes our pharmacy presentation, and thanks to Jennifer for collecting questions. We will be in touch with you within a week or so.